Hi everyone, this is John Bacon, and welcome to another Community Management Crib Notes. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a new era of community management. This was the presentation that I originally delivered at the OSCON conference in Portland, Oregon in 2011. Now this presentation is all about filling in the blanks in community management and leadership. Community management has become a hot topic in the last few years, but the art and science of how we grow and build communities is still very new. So this presentation summarizes uh, some of the experiences that I've had as a community manager over the years and talks about where I feel like the profession is evolving. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jono, and I work currently as the Ubuntu Community Manager for Canonical. Um, I lead a team of community managers that basically builds and grows a fun and enthusiastic Ubuntu community around the world. I'm also really interested in the profession of community management. Um, so I wrote a book called The Art of Community, which is published by O'Reilly. Um, and I also organize the Community Leadership Summit, which happens each year in Portland, Oregon, just before OSCOM. Now, communities are everywhere. We have, of course, our local neighborhood communities, but we also have giant online communities that we participate in every day, too. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Wikipedia and Facebook and Twitter and Google+. Each of these different communities provides an opportunity for us to get information, to share information, and to share experiences with people, either locally or internationally. Now, irrespective of the kind of community that we're talking about, I believe that all communities can fall into one of two broad categories. They're either read communities or write communities. So a good example of a read community is a group of people who get together to talk about Lost or The Lord of the Rings or The Doors or whatever it might be. These are people who are basically there to consume together because consuming things together is fun. I mean, that's the reason why a lot of people like to watch TV shows together, go to the movies together, go to shows together to watch bands, those kinds of things. But fundamentally, people are not necessarily collaborating around the thing that brings them together. If you come together uh, because you like Lord of the Rings, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can actually influence the Lord of the Rings. It's the consumption that is interesting to the community. Uh, now, there are, of course, some exceptions here. There's people like Joss Whedon and various other people who actually look to their communities for inspiration and actually to participate in different ways. But they're kind of the weird offshoots. Generally, when people get together in read communities, they're there to consume as opposed to affect the thing that brings them together. But then we have right communities, and right communities are communities that are formed by people who build something together. And a great example of this is Ubuntu. The Ubuntu project brings together a variety of different people from different backgrounds, skills and experiences from all over the world who work together to build the Ubuntu operating system. For those of you who don't know what Ubuntu is, it's basically um, it's an alternative to Windows or Mac on desktops. Um, there's also a server edition and Ubuntu also runs on a variety of other devices too. But many people join the Ubuntu community because they are happy Ubuntu users and they want to meet other Ubuntu users. And then they realize that they can actually influence and improve Ubuntu itself. Unlike the Lord of the Rings example that I gave earlier on, which is a read community, when you join the Ubuntu community, you can actually change Ubuntu itself. Now I'm going to be talking very much in this presentation about the thought processes and experiences of somebody who has, who has primarily been involved in building right communities. But if you're interested in read communities as well, don't worry, most of the content in this presentation can apply equally. But you know what? Every great story, and this one, <laughs> has a beginning, and the beginning for this story looked like this. This is me when I was about 18 years old. Um, as you can see, I had a lot more hair going on back then. I was just as ugly as I am today, and that piece of paper's got some ideas that I was scrawling down about how a community could work. Um, I was really just starting to get into the whole community thing back then. Now, spin forward by about uh, 12 or 14 years, and this is how I look today. I'm sat in front of a, a set of steps. It's all professionally lit. I've got my little black long sleeve t-shirt thing going on, and I've got a professional smile on my face. Now, in those uh, 12 years or so, I've learned a lot about how communities work, but I've learned those things from observing other people. Now, one of those people that I learned a lot from was Linus Torvalds, and he looks like this today. Um, he's stood in front of a very professionally lit background, he's got a professional smile on his face, and he's folding his arms as if to say, you know what? I'm the Chuck Norris of the technology world, and you know it. Now, just like Linus Torvalds looks professional and professionally lit today, when he was younger, he also looked like a dork as well. And this is how he looked. He sat there with those glasses on, with that smile, and with whatever's in that bottle. 
Now, most people know Linus Torvalds as the creator of Linux, and uh, Linux has had a tremendous impact on the technology industry. In fact, Linux and the Linux kernel is the foundation for many products that we see today, uh, from systems such as Ubuntu or Fedora or Debian, to the technology that's shipped in many fridges and cars. But while people look at um, Linus as this incredible programmer, one of the reasons why I took inspiration for him, from him was for his engineering management, for the things that he brought to the fold in how we manage and coordinate large technology projects. Now, Linus, rather unwittingly, actually filled in many of the blanks in community management and leadership. Um, he put together this little kernel project that was just a hobby of his, um, and, it, and it exploded into this big thing that everybody was interested in. Many, many programmers were coming forward to contribute and to participate to help make their hardware work as well. So consequently, Linus had to deal with a lot of growth, and he identified ways of handling that growth and ensuring people could participate. He also wanted to make it very much of a transparent project, so everybody could get the code, everybody could contribute, the discussion was all very transparent as well. And he put processes in place to um, ensure that transparency was set and to handle that growth. Now, growth means more people, more people means more discussion, more discussion means more opinions, and of course more opinions means more conflict. And Linus himself identified ways in which he could handle those conflict situations, yet still find a way for people to work together and to keep the project moving forward. Now, while this was going on, there was many people around the world who were watching this quiet revolution taking place. This was really interesting. We had this idea of people from diverse backgrounds, skills, and experiences throwing their contributions into a melting pot and a single product coming out that would benefit everybody. It means that one person could spend one hour of their time to create something that could potentially benefit thousands or even millions of other people from around the world. One of these people who was watching was me. I was absolutely captivated by all of this, but it really wasn't the technology that was interesting to me. It was really the social dynamic about what was happening. Here you have hundreds and thousands of people around the world who have never met each other, who are connected by the internet, and who are able to work on something together that will benefit everybody. To me, this opened up this huge can of worms about how this social dynamic works. How do people gain the knowledge and the tools to participate? How do they know what to work on? How do they work with these other people from all over the world who they've never met and not get into arguments and conflict? How do they work together and not duplicate each other's work? I just found this absolutely fascinating. But while Linus was an inspiration, he certainly wasn't alone. There was various other people involved in the free software and open source world who were creating and building interesting projects and learning these valuable lessons about how we as a global community could work together. People such as Richard Stallman here on the left, who's the founder of the GNU Project and the Free Software Foundation. Um, Alan Cox in the middle, who contributed interesting ideas and technology to the Linux kernel, as well as Linus. And this guy on the right, Ian Murdoch. Ian was the founder of Debian. Now, out of these three people, the person who I found most interesting was Ian Murdoch. Um, Ian, as the founder of the Debian Project, was building a community in which people around the world could take all of these different pieces of free software and open source and package them together into a system that was easy to use. Now, I think Ian took many of the things that had been learnt from Linus and other people, such as growth and transparency and processes and conflict, and he identified a set of learnings that were interesting too. For example, Debian is a, is a project with a very firm sense of direction, a very firm sense of strategic direction, and I think he identified ways in which you can build those strategies um, in a collaborative fashion from people from all around the world. Uh, Debian is also a very effectively governed project. There is different ways in which people can participate, different ways in which people can demonstrate capabilities and worth, and many of those lessons were learned in the Debian project as well. Debian is also a very efficient project in how people can learn the skills that are required to participate and how they can contribute to the project. And I think the Debian project also um, learned many lessons about conduct and how we can define standards of behavior and how people can work together as effectively as possible. So the Debian project formed and many people joined the project and participated. And just like with Linux, there was many people around the world who were also watching. And one of those people was also me. I was particularly interested in Debian because I was seeing people getting together and bringing a different set of skills. With Linux, it was very much about programming and about technical engineering. With Debian, it was still very much of a technical environment, but what was really interesting to me was that people were participating in different ways. We saw people helping out with uh, packaging and documentation and support and IRC and various other ways. Debian was a more diverse project than Linux and consequently it threw up an, an equally diverse set of questions about how people can collaborate effectively. 
Now, some years later, the Ubuntu project formed. And Ubuntu is actually based upon Debian. And there's always been a very close relationship between Ubuntu and Debian, both in terms of technology and infrastructure, as well as community experience and governance. As such, the Ubuntu project was very much based on many of these learnings from Debian and these other projects as well. Many of the things that we discussed earlier on, such as growth, strategy, transparency, processes, conflict, governance, efficiency, and conduct. But Ubuntu also was targeting a slightly different group of people. In the Ubuntu project, we very much went after people from a less technical background as well. So we wanted people to participate in the technology and packaging and programming and QA and all those types of things. But we also wanted to grow a community of people who could participate in other ways as well, such as forming local teams and user groups around the world, uh, such as people being able to collaborate around design and art and things such as that. So as we grew our own global community, we also filled in some of these gaps in, in the knowledge and best practice of community leadership and management. Things such as metrics. Um, a lot of the projects that, we, that we've worked on in Ubuntu have been based upon tracking growth and identifying and reacting to growth as it changes. Uh, things such as reporting, helping different teams to communicate their progress and, and, what, and what they're focusing on between each other. Things such as buzz, building excitement um, with different demographics of people who may be interested in participating in Ubuntu or just using Ubuntu. And also things such as events. Uh, we, we, we created the Ubuntu Developer Summit, which is a very different type of event about how people can get together in the same building to map out plans and, and strategy for how we build each new Ubuntu release. But what I've been talking about here has been very much the Linux world and the evolution of Linux and free software and open source. What was really interesting to me was when Wikipedia happened. And the reason why is because Wikipedia happened at a time when many of these lessons had been learned. We'd seen many of these online collaborative projects functioning and functioning well. But now we wanted to look at these different learnings through a very different kind of lens. And this was the lens of people, instead of creating software, they were creating information and creating knowledge. What happened with Wikipedia is that it demonstrated on a huge scale the sheer opportunity of community. Wikipedia very quickly became one of the most popular sites on the internet and still is today. And people around the world started realizing that the true value of Wikipedia and its extensive catalog of content was formed from collaborative community. But this history lesson is not really why I put together this presentation. My goal here wasn't to tell you about the history of Linux and Debian and Ubuntu and why Wikipedia was so interesting. The reason why I wanted to put this presentation together is because I believe we're at the forefront of a new era of community management. In fact, I believe that we're starting to see the renaissance of community management. Now, the traditional renaissance that happened between the 14th and 17th centuries uh, is what many people see as the bridge between the Middle Ages and the modern era. Now, what many people consider to be the catalyst of the Renaissance was the fact that people started writing the things that they'd learned down. And this formed this wide educational base of learnings that other people could read and develop those skills themselves. In other words, earlier in human history, we pretty much learned things by watching other people doing things. But now we were writing those lessons down into books, and that would support the ability for lots and lots of people to be educated in those skills and art forms. I believe the same kind of thing is happening in community management and leadership. In the earlier days, Linus Torvalds didn't set out as an expert in community management. He tried some things that he thought would work, and some of those things did work, and some of those things didn't work. He learned from his experiences, and other people observed those experiences and observed those learnings and folded them into their own communities. But I believe that we're getting to an interesting point now where we're amassing this body of knowledge about how we build these communities, online and offline. But instead of merely observing people who are building interesting communities, I believe we're now getting to a point where we're interested in documenting and defining best practice for successful techniques for building community. And this is what I'm really passionate about. This is the reason why I wrote The Art of Community, and this is the reason why I run the Community Leadership Summit each year, is because I believe that no one should ever have a monopoly on community management best practice. This is something that's fundamental in us as human beings, and there are so many experiences and best practice and techniques that we can share between each other to help us build effective communities in many different places. I believe that the community management renaissance has also been furthered by the fact that there is huge demand from companies to build communities around their products. If there's one thing that open source has taught us is that when you have a community that's really interested and invested in a project and a company that can derive value from that project, a great partnership can form. 
But that partnership is a two-way street. It's like a traditional relationship. If you have someone who only ever takes and doesn't give back, it never ends well. So consequently, over the last couple of years, as companies have wanted to build their own communities or invest in existing communities, a body of best practice has been required around how you can be a great partner as a company, how you can invest in that relationship, get maximum value from that community, yet respect the norms and the culture of that community in the way it was intended. Many of the topics here are the kind of things that we do in that kind of work. Topics such as project management and privacy and collaboration, how we resource things, how we hire people, how we build capacity, how we build mindshare, how we fund projects, how we sprint and work together at events. Those are the kind of things that community managers and companies need to work on. As such, the Renaissance isn't just about building great community. It's about building great community managers. It is about building knowledge and skills and forming experiences that can help those community managers to manage those relationships between companies and communities so that both can be really happy partners. Now, part of the responsibility of community managers is to communicate the true value and importance of community internally. One of the things about companies is that generally people are very focused on their own internal goals. They have a set of goals to achieve, a set of tasks that need to be executed to complete those goals, and they want to focus on those goals to be successful. It's often easy to forget about communities. It's often easy to forget about those people external to this internal organizational culture. What we want to get away from is people inside companies thinking that community members look like this. Now, just to be clear, I'm talking about the guy on the right. The guy on the left is also slightly unusual looking, bulges in some of the wrong places, but that's me. As such, today I want to talk a little bit about some techniques and approaches that you can use to build a strong community from the perspective of someone in a company acting as a community manager, and then to communicate the value of that community back to the company. If you're a community manager and you work for a company, or if you want to be a community manager and you want to be employed to do this kind of work, you should definitely pay attention to the rest of the presentation, because I think some of these things will be really useful to you. Now, I believe that there's five core areas in which we can do this work. First of all, we need to hire carefully. Secondly, we need to build trust in our communities. Thirdly, we need to govern those communities well. Fourth, we need to build a successful on-ramp so people can participate. And then finally, we need to keep score and track what's going on. So let's look at the first one, hire carefully. Now what I'm talking about here is finding the right person to build the right kind of community. If you're a company and you're looking to build out your community strategy, this is about finding the community manager with the correct set of skills, experience and motivation to be successful in building your particular community. If you're a community manager and you're looking for somewhere to work, this is about finding the right company that can use your skills effectively to build a community as well. Now, when you're interviewing someone for a position or when you're interviewing for a position, in my mind, it's not about whether you're right to work for that company or not, or whether that person's right to work for your company. It's about whether that role fits that particular person. I personally have interviewed many people over the years for my team who've been wonderfully smart and articulate and intelligent, but the particular role that they're hiring for is not really the right one for them. Now, hiring for community managers can be pretty complicated because not only with the beginning of this profession, of, the, of this renaissance, um, but there is also a fairly significant set of skills and capabilities required to do this kind of work. Typically, when I'm recruiting for a community manager, I'm looking for three things. One is domain experience within the community I'm trying to build. Two is community management experience. And three is just that special something where someone's always going to be interested and motivated and willing to learn and willing to progress. Now, you're going to get some people who are going to be stronger in some of those areas and weaker in others. What we're looking for here is a balance. We're looking for somebody with some domain experience who has experience of growing communities and has the motivation to learn and progress. A great community manager with no domain experience is just as ineffective as someone with great domain experience with very few community management skills. Now, when you do find someone for your community management position, I really strongly suggest that you don't make the same mistake a lot of companies make, and that is to send that person around the globe a few times. Of course, it's important to get that person out and visible and meet in the community and getting to know other people. But you've got to bear in mind as well that travel is not only expensive in terms of dollars, it's also expensive in terms of time. For every hour that your community manager is in a plane and not in front of a computer, they're not going to be spending time with your particular community. 
If you look at any typical trip to a conference, for example, it's going to involve your community manager traveling. It's going to involve them spending time at the conference and not being online, not being in front of email, not being in front of chat channels, and not being there and receptive and responsive to your community. Now, I know this is a tremendous buzzkill for those of you who want to join a company and travel from conference to conference. Um, but this is about value in terms of your time and actually working with your community on a day-to-day -day basis. And while travel brings certain benefits um, to a community management position, it also definitively brings certain costs. Now, another question a lot of uh, technology companies have when they hire a community manager is, does that person report to engineering or marketing? And there's been some debate in the, in the community management industry about this particular question. In my mind, it really depends on the kind of community that that person is going to be growing and the kind of work that they're going to be doing. As an example, if that person is going to be working with a collaborative engineering community with developers, with documentation writers and translators and people like that who are building technology, I highly recommend that that person reports to an engineering um, position. If that person, if your community manager is going to be more about um, public relations and speaking at conferences and uh, promoting the product and sharing the product with other people and helping to get it out to a wider base, then maybe marketing is going to be a better position. I think another consideration here is the level of exposure to those respective departments that you want this person to have. As an example, when I joined Canonical originally to work as the Ubuntu Community Manager, I was reporting to the founder of the company. And then shortly afterwards, about six or seven months into my position, I moved over to report to the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer, and a more of an engineering-oriented uh, management team. And that exposure to the engineering side of, of Ubuntu was hugely beneficial for me in terms of knowing where the problems and the, and the tough spots were in the communities that we needed to build. Now the second area from our list earlier on that we need to focus on is building trust. And what I'm talking about here is building a proactive, trusting relationship between the company and the community. And we can very much think of this as a two-way street. Typically, when there's a relationship between a company and a community, it's because there is an open project that, they, that, that, that is the community, and the company invests resources into that project to get particular outcomes that benefit the company and its products. And this is definitely a two-way street. But when we talk about this, traditionally, we often talk about it within the context of community. How do we build trust with the community? Um, how do we get the community to, tr to trust that the intentions of the company um, are fair and reasonable? Now, this is important and valuable work. The community doesn't have to trust your company. Uh, trust must be earned, and it's going to be earned through the day-to-day -day conduct from the people who are participating in that particular community. Um, and one of the great ways in which we can do this is through building um, a strong sense of transparency into the way that we work. If the, if the community can see into the company, can see how the, the company operates, and can see how people in the company work together, and how they participate in the community, it builds a strong sense of trust because it doesn't feel like anything is hidden behind closed doors. Now, the other side of this two-way street is building trust with the management team. Now, as a community manager, you will be intimately familiar with the premise of how communities work and the opportunities that communities can bring to companies. Uh, but for other people who are less familiar with this, community can be seen with a certain amount of suspicion, a certain amount of doubt about whether this is really worth spending our dollars on in this economy. As such, one of your responsibilities is going to be building this sense of trust between the management team and community and being able to demonstrate the value that working with that community brings to the company. Now, the third item on our list is govern well. Most people typically associate governance and communities with large communities, uh, but I think this also equally applies to some smaller communities as well. The way we can think of governance uh, is the process in and out points for how people actively participate in a particular community. So let me give you an example. This is pretty much the governance structure of the Ubuntu community. Um, I've left out some of the details because my goal here is to illustrate the point as opposed to the details of the Ubuntu community. Um, as you can see, we have two boards at the top. We have the Community Council and the Technical Board. These are, the, these are two boards that are populated by primarily community members. The Community Council 
um, defines community policy um, in, in the wider Ubuntu project, and the technical board defines technical policy. So as an example, the community council um, decides on how people can become Ubuntu members. This is how people can demonstrate significant and sustained contributions. The technical board will define policy surrounding um, which particular technologies we, we want to focus on, what we want to ship, um, patent-related issues, and that kind of thing. This map isn't particularly accurate because Mark Shuttleworth, these boards don't report to Mark Shuttleworth, but he has a veto on each of the boards. Now, you then have, for example, on the Community Council side, you've got the IRC Council, the Forums Council, the Loco Council, the Membership Boards. Each of these are sub-councils that basically report to the Community Council, and each of them has their own board of five to seven people, primarily community members, who look out after those respective domains. So as an example, the Forums Council, those folks manage the Ubuntu Forums, which has got over a million members on there. Um, and those people uh, on the Forums Council will, will, will define policy um, and, uh, and best practice around how the forums are operated. Now, the reason why we have this uh, fairly elaborate uh, structure is because the Ubuntu community is so big that we, uh, we, we need to break out the leadership into these different groups. At one point in time, um, we used to just have the Community Council and the Technical Board, but what happened is the Community Council got so overwhelmed, as an example, um, with all of the requests that were coming into it, um, that they just didn't have time to deal with everything. And that's the reason why we broke it out into these sub-councils. The other benefit of bringing out uh, breaking it into these sub-councils is that it provides better domain experience in each of those areas. That meant that, for example, with the Forums Council, we could make sure that the people who were on that particular council were, their, their, their primary areas of expertise were with the forums, and that would make it better for the community to get their needs served. Now, if you have a smaller community of 10, 20, 30, 40 people, whatever it might be, this kind of approach will be complete and total overkill. You certainly don't need to set up all of these councils uh, if you have a small, uh, a small number of participants in your community. But what I really do encourage you to do is to define very clearly how the leadership works in, the, in your community. It may be one person. It may be one person calls all the shots, or it may be a small group of people who are able to make decisions it's up to your community and what you need to do, but clearly define how you make decisions, who's leading the project, and who's defining where the project moves forward. The reason why this is important for most communities is because most communities function on a premise of transparency, and being able to clearly say, this is how our leadership works and this is how we make decisions is useful in giving confidence to the rest of the community that the leadership is also working in, in a transparent way as well. Now, the fourth area that we had in our list earlier on is building the on-ramp. Um, now, what I mean by the on-ramp is something such as this. And I think that this pretty much applies to most collaborative communities. And what this is, this is the set of points that someone goes through in participating in a particular project. So let's use a software project as an example. If you want to participate in in, in programming in a particular software project, these are the stages that you go through. The first thing is going to be identifying the on-ramp. It's going to be knowing that you can actually take part. This is going to be about communicating outwards that this is an open project, everyone's welcome to participate, everyone's welcome to contribute. The second area is going to be about developing knowledge in that particular community member. This is about making sure that they can develop the skills that they need to participate, making sure that they've got the ability to learn those skills, to find support and help and guidance in how, that they, in how they can develop the necessary requirements to actually make an active contribution to the project. The third area is going to be about determining contributions. Now, it's really easy for us to go out there and tell people that they can take part. It's easy for me to go out there and say, you know what, you want to join my software project? Project, it's easy. You can participate as a programmer. But that doesn't actually get anything done. What we want to do is we want to give them specific things to work on. I've seen many situations in the past where people have had um, the necessary skills to take part, they're really excited about it, but they just don't know where to start. A great technique that I've used in the past uh, for this, particularly in software projects, is actually have a set of bugs called bite-sized bugs. These are bugs with fairly easy things that need fixing, um, no more than 30 minutes of time, but a great start in which somebody can fix something, solve a problem, bring some value to the project and feel good about it. 
Um, it's getting that first contribution in that will often keep someone around for a little bit longer because they feel good about the fact that they've used their time and expertise to make that particular project better. And then the final element is growing kudos. And this is something that I've noticed a lot of communities don't do such a good job on. And that is you have all of these people taking time away from their friends and their families and, uh, and their hobbies and whatever else to contribute to the community. Um, and if there's one thing that makes a community member feel great or any one of us feel great about, about our work, it's when people appreciate it. Um, so I think it's important as community managers that we think of ways in which we can celebrate those contributions and really highlight those contributions in a way that makes that person feel good. But to also, on the flip side, do it in such a way that it doesn't demotivate somebody else. Um, for all, you may celebrate one person's contributions. Somebody else may feel slightly put out by the fact that you didn't celebrate their contributions. So this is very much of a of a balance as well. Okay, now the final item in our list from earlier on is to keep score. Now, different community managers have different approaches to how they track their work, um, ranging from some community managers who just don't track their work and they just go out there and uh, execute a series of different activities or tasks to basically build growth, but they don't really necessarily track uh, whether that growth is occurring. And then you get other community managers who are completely obsessive about statistics. Now, let's be, let's be honest. No one likes statistics. No one. No one. No one likes statistics. Some of us pretend that we need to like statistics. Um, some of us feel like statistics are, in fact, necessary. But no one actually likes statistics. And statistics don't really tell us anything unless they're outlining a particular outcome. So as an example, the number of Twitter followers that you've got doesn't necessarily demonstrate growth. The number of posts that somebody has on a forum doesn't necessarily demonstrate the quality of the content. And sometimes we use these kinds of figures to illustrate that we're making progress in a particular project or a particular part of the community. The problem with judging success based upon the number of Twitter followers that you've got or something such as the number of posts on your forum is that individually these numbers are actually pretty unintelligent. Uh, they don't really tell us a huge amount. What we're really interested in is the quality of the community experience or the success of a particular piece of work that you've been doing in growing your community. The key point here is that it is really important for us to keep score. It's important for us to define and identify a set of metrics that we want to track. Otherwise, we can't gauge our success and otherwise we can't course correct when we're not necessarily making the kind of progress that we want to make. But in picking the metrics and the numbers that we want to track, it's important that we view those numbers and those metrics holistically in how they tell a particular story about our work. Now, while it's always important for us to track growth, we should also track progress as well. Now, the chart that you can see here is a technique that I've used extensively to track and manage the work of my teams, and this is called a burndown chart. Let me explain how it works. So the x-axis along the bottom is basically a chunk of time. In this case, it's the duration of an Ubuntu release cycle. Um, along the left-hand side, uh, you've got the total number of work items that needed that need to be complete in that time frame. So in this particular situation, we've got about 250 work items and they've got to be completed in approximately about six months. Um, the goal of the burndown chart is to basically guarantee the regular, consistent uh, completion of those work items throughout that, that time period. So each day, a new bar is plotted on the graph that basically is, uh, is colored to reflect the number of items that are yet to do, the number of items that are in progress, and the number of items that have been completed. So you can see the completed items in the green, the, the in-progress items in the gray, and the, um, and the items that are yet to be completed in the red and the orange. Um, you then have this black line that goes from the beginning of the time period to the end of the time period, and you can see that it goes from the top of the chart to the bottom of the chart. The idea is very, very simple. All you need to do is you need to make sure that the to-do items, that's the red and the orange, always stay beneath that trend line. If you always keep those it items beneath the trend line, you will complete all of those items uh, in a regular and consistent way throughout the rest of the cycle. 
Now, one of the wonderful things about burndown charts is they actually serve two different audiences pretty well. So first of all, for the team, for the people who are working uh, on, on the ground to, to, to execute in these projects, it's great for keeping all that work on track. Um, I actually recommend that you have a burndown chart not only for the team, but you also have a burndown chart for each person on that team as well. And this is something that we've used extensively in Ubuntu. But the other thing that's useful about it is as soon as someone understands how a burndown chart works, you can look within a heartbeat and know whether a team is on track. So as soon as you explain this to, uh, for example, a management team, we talked earlier on about making sure that you, uh, you build trust with both your community and with your management. And part of that is explaining the success and, and progress that's been made with the community. As soon as a, a, as a member of the management team understands how this chart works, they can see within a second uh, that the team is either on track or it's not on track. Now, over the last 10 minutes or so, I've talked about these five different areas. Number one, hire carefully. Number two, build trust. Number three, govern well. Number four, build the on-ramp. And number five, keep score. Each of these different five areas are designed to put quality in the ground when it comes to what you want to grow out of your community. But I think that we can judge what we can expect from a community manager, either from the perspective of a company or a community, or from the perspective of what a community manager can expect from him or herself, we can judge those things in three primary areas. And these are three values that I hold um, important to myself in the work that I do. And I'd like to share these with you folks because I think these things can keep us on the right path. The first thing is that we're here to bring value. We're here to bring value to both the community and to the company. We're this important bridging point um, that, 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 that often acts as a translation layer between the requirements of the community and the requirements of the, of the company and how each of those different entities can, can satisfy each of those requirements. The second area is to provide visibility and work, and this always spins both ways. We often think about this within the context of providing visibility on the, the work done by the company. You know, the, the company's invested in a particular community and we need to provide visibility on those important investments. But it also spins the other way around as well. I mean, if you've got great work going on in the community, you want to make sure that the company is aware of this so the company can encourage and, and work with and participate with those people who are doing that great work. This is also good for recruiting as well. If someone's doing great work in the community, you want to make sure the company knows about it so they can potentially hire them. But then the third area is how we identify potential. One of the wonderful things about being in the community management position is that you've got a tremendous insight into this community, but then also a tremendous insight into the company as well. Um, a community manager often has a good overview of all the different work that is going on in a community and much of the work that's going on in, in, in a company as well. So there's an opportunity for this person to identify potential to solve problems on both sides of the fence. So if there's a, a particular community project, the community manager may be able to find some funding or some support or some, some guidance from the company. And likewise, if the company wants to achieve a particular outcome, there may be some projects going on in the community that could serve those purposes as well as well. The general rule of thumb in my mind that encases all of this and the responsibility of a great community manager is to always be striving for new ideas and new perspectives, but to base those new ideas and perspectives on a strong foundation of predictability. So uh, great community is built by new ideas and fresh ideas, um, but when we track those, those ideas with tools such as burn down charts and we track effective metrics and we build strategy and governance around our projects, then it means that we can deliver these ideas in an effective manner. Well, I'm going to wrap this up now and I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who've, who've listened this far and, uh, and checked out this presentation. I hope it was useful. Um, you can read a lot more about this in my book, The Art of Community, which is published by O'Reilly. Uh, you can find out more about that at artofcommunityonline.org. You can also follow me uh, on my website at uh, www.johnobacon.org and you can follow me on Twitter as well at twitter.com forward slash johnobacon. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Take care.